We are going over chapter 26, the urinary system. So the first thing to look at is what the urinary system consists of. It consists of kidneys, ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. These are the anatomical structures. What about the functions of the urinary system? So we need to regulate ionic compositions of our fluids. This includes our ions, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride. We need to regulate our blood pH, and that's going to have to do with regulating the levels of H plus and bicarb HCO3 minus. And we need to regulate our blood volume. In other words, how much blood do we have circulating? And that's, of course, going to have to do with how much water we have. This is going to go hand in hand with blood pressure regulation because if your blood volume is higher, your blood pressure will be higher as well. If, it, if the blood volume is lower, the blood pressure will drop. Let's look at the renal anatomy or the anatomy of the kidney itself. So the point of entrance or exit is called the hilum, and the hilum is where you're going to find the renal artery, the renal vein, the ureter, also nerves and lymphatics. In this picture, you see the renal hilum, which is this area right here. You can see the renal artery, the renal vein, and the ureter. If we slice it open and look inside, we'll notice that we have a cortex, which is the outside part encircling the kidney. And we also have a renal medulla, which you can see is subdivided into pyramids, which are these triangular structures. Now, within that, you are going to have the urine-making unit, which is called the nephron. And the nephron is going to have parts of it inside the cortex, but then it's going to have parts of it that go into the medulla, come back out into the cortex, and then you'll have these collecting ducts, which collect the urine that the nephron has produced, and those collecting ducts will bring the urine all the way down to this funnel-shaped minor calyx. From the minor calyx, the urine will go into the major calyx. From the major calyx, it'll go into the renal pelvis, and then to the ureter. So let's just follow what would happen here if we have the urine that gets funneled here into the minor calyx. From several minor calyces from each pyramid, you would have that urine then accumulating in the major calyces, there and there, let's say. And so all the major calyces would then bring their contents into this larger area called the renal pelvis. And then from there, the renal pelvis can funnel the urine to the ureter, and the ureter will take it down to the urinary bladder. Let's look at the blood and nerve supply of the kidneys. So the blood supply is very significant. Even though your kidneys are about 0.5% of your total body mass, they receive 20 to 25% of your cardiac output at rest. Let's look at this graph down here. At rest, your total cardiac output is about five liters per minute. And look at the renal cardiac output right here. It is at a little over one liter per minute at about 22% of your total cardiac output. Now, during moderate exercise, we're going to try to shut down those kidneys because we don't need to be making urine while we are exercising. Or if you want to think about a fight or flight situation, 
that's not the most important thing at that moment. So your cardiac output, first of all, goes up significantly. Your heart rate will increase, bringing up your cardiac output. Notice here it's about almost 18 liters per minute from 5 to 18. And most of that blood is going to get pushed to the muscular system. So how do we shut off the kidneys? We constrict the renal arterioles. And so we don't let as much blood flow go to them. And notice here the renal cardiac output is now 600 milliliters per minute. It's pretty much been cut in half. And this is during moderate exercise. What about the nerve supply? So really, for the nerve supply, we're concerned with the sympathetic outflow. The sympathetic nervous system is going to affect the kidneys. And so basically, at rest, your sympathetic tone will be lower. So there won't be as much sympathetic tone there. And that's going to open up those renal arterioles and bring more blood to the kidneys. But during a fight or flight episode or during exercise, your sympathetic tone goes up, and that's where those nerves will close off the blood flow to the kidneys and bring that blood flow elsewhere where you need it. There are two types of nephrons. One is the cortical nephron, and this nephron composes 80 to 85% of all your nephrons. And the second type of nephron is called the juxtamedullary nephron. Now, we call it the cortical nephron because it begins higher up in the cortex and does not go as deep into the medulla. We call it the juxtamedullary nephron because the uh, deeper part of it goes way deep into the medulla. Let's zoom in and look at the anatomy of these two types of nephrons. So we want to start with the blood flow. And so notice here that you have what is called an afferent arteriole. And this afferent arteriole is going to bring blood to the nephron. Now, this afferent arteriole will start looping into a spherically shaped capillary structure called a glomerulus. And so you can see here that it kind of turns into this round shaped cluster, and that's called a glomerulus. Now, that's where the fluid from the blood will get pushed out into the nephron. And that first part of the nephron that receives that fluid is known as the Bowman's capsule. And that's this structure right here that is, it's wrapping around that glomerulus and it's going to receive the fluid. Now, the blood leaves via the efferent arterial. And that is this branch right here. That's where the blood leaves from. And notice that now the blood flow breaks up into this capillary bed called a peritubular capillary network. And you can see that it winds and weaves all over the place with the rest of the nephron. So we're going to see it over and over again as we talk about the physiology of the nephron. Let's follow the fluid that got pushed out of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So at this point, we call the fluid filtrate. We do not call it urine yet. And that's because it's going to change significantly as it moves through the nephron. So we're right here. This filtrate is going to be going through this tube. And this part of the tube that is closer to the Bowman's capsule is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, it's called the proximal convoluted tubule because it's closer to the Bowman's capsule. 
It's called convoluted because you can tell that it is very loopy. And it's called tubule because it is, in essence, just a tube. And so now the filtrate's going to be changing as it moves through this, but it's going to move through this, and then it's going to reach a point where the tubule straightens out and descends into the medulla right here. And this part right here is called the descending limb, the descending limb. And you can see that it's going to go down this way into the medulla, and at some point it's going to bend, and that's called the loop of Henle. It's going to bend in this loop, and it's going to go back up towards the cortex through the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And so it's going to go up this way, and then it's going to reach very close to the Bowman's capsule here, and it's going to start looping again. And at this point, we call it the distal convoluted tubule. Now we call it distal because it's further away. Now it looks close, but that's because it's been bent this way in this formation. However, just imagine extending it out straightening it out, and at that point, it would definitely be distal. It would be further away from the capsule if you were to unwind this and straighten it out. So now the filtrate, still called filtrate, is going to be winding through that distal convoluted tubule, and finally, it's going to get to the collecting duct. So the collecting duct is this bigger tube piece right here which is no longer part of that nephron. It is a collecting tube for several nephrons. So there will be a nephron here that gives its contents to the collecting duct. There will be another nephron here that gives its contents, another one here. So you can see these different points of entry. The collecting duct at this point will bring it down this way. Now, here we can still change the filtrate. So it's not urine yet. It can still change throughout this collecting duct, and we're going to see how that works towards the end of the lecture. But here notice that you find the renal papilla, and right under that renal papilla, that's going to be where the, where the minor calyx is found. So let's look instead at the juxtamedullary nephron. The juxtamedullary nephron is very similar. It has the same parts. However, the Bowman's capsule is lower in the cortex. So the, the capsule itself is lower in the cortex than the cortical nephron capsule. It still has a proximal convoluted tubule. It still has a descending limb, but notice how long that descending limb is. It's going to go into the deepest parts of the medulla, and that's very important for how we can make concentrated urine, and we're going to see that later on in the lecture, how that works. Right now we're just looking at the anatomy. So see how low that goes. That's why it's called juxtamedullary, because it goes deep into the medulla, almost reaching that area of that minor calyx over there. And it's going to go into the ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule. And then again, over here, it's going to drain into the collecting duct. And the collecting duct is going to have several points of entry from different nephrons. Now, regarding the blood supply here, throughout all of these tubules and we're going to talk we're going to talk about this blood supply in detail regarding the physiology but all these tubules regardless of where you are are going to have a capillary right next to it these peritubular capillaries are going to be found everywhere and that's where the changes in the filtrate are going to take place 
because we're either going to reabsorb certain things that we want in our blood stream, or we're going to secrete things into the tubule from the bloodstream. And so all the changes that take place throughout the nephron will have to be with a tubule and with a paratubular capillary right next door. Let's look at one of the functions of having this nephron that bends in the way it does and ask yourself the question why the tubule seems to get very close to that afferent and efferent arterial right there. There's a reason for that. And the reason is that as this filtrate goes up this way, the cells that are making up this tubule right here will be able to check the filtrate for salt levels. And based on those salt levels, it can influence the afferent arterial's diameter by basically secreting certain um, molecules that can cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction of that afferent arterial. Now imagine that you have blood going through this afferent arterial. And if you wanted to slow down urine production, you would have to close off that arterial. And so you'd want to vasoconstrict that arterial. And this point of communication, and we're going to talk about this in more detail in future slides, but that point of communication where the tubule runs into the arterial is known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now I'm pointing this out now because several pictures are going to be labeled uh, in two different ways. So notice that this picture uh, labeled one on the left, this tubule that runs into the arterial is that ascending limb that looks like it's still straight right here. It hasn't started convoluting yet. So it's the ascending limb of the nephron. But notice that in the second example on the right, this tubule seems to already start bending right here and looks like it is a distal convoluted tubule already. So you will have some uh, variety of how these tubules start to bend by the time they run into those arterioles. And so uh, this juxtaglomerular apparatus that we're going to see in pictures in the next couple of slides, sometimes you'll see that that tubule is labeled as the ascending limb, and sometimes you'll see that that tubule is, is labeled as the distal convoluted tubule. Just realize the pictures are referring to the same exact thing. It's still the juxtaglomerular apparatus, or sometimes just JG apparatus. So let's look at what we mean when we say renal corpuscle. Renal corpuscle is a term that we use for the glomerulus, which if you remember is that spherical ball-shaped uh, cluster of arteries, of, uh, of capillaries, excuse me, and the Bowman's capsule that surrounds it and receives the filtrate. And so we're talking about this part right here where filtration begins. And filtration is a term that we use for when fluid goes from the capillary to the capsule, into the capsule. And this is driven by the pressures. And we're going to talk about these pressures, but the pressures that we talked about in the Starling law of the capillaries, the blood hydrostatic pressure and the blood colloid osmotic pressure driven by those pressures, and those pressures are only going to discriminate based on the size of those molecules that are in the blood. And so if the molecules are small enough, 
they will get through, but if they are too large, they will not get through. And so this is one of the pictures I told you about regarding what is this part right here? What is this? This right here is being labeled as the ascending limb of the nephron loop. And so that is part of the juxta glomerular apparatus. And so notice that here you have this juxta glomerular cell being labeled right there. And that's a cell that's found in the afferent arterial. And ask yourself why these cells are so close together. These are the macula densa cells of the ascending limb, which are checking the contents of the filtrate. And based on the concentration of salts in that filtrate, they will be influencing the juxta glomerular cells to either vasoconstrict or to vasodilate that afferent arterial. And again, if we vasodilate it, if we open it up, we're going to allow more blood to flow in. And if we allow more blood to flow in, we're going to have more filtration taking place from the uh, glomerulus into the capsule. However, if we vasoconstrict and we close it off, then there's less blood flow, which means filtration will also decrease. And so this juxtaglomerular apparatus is a very important anatomical location for how we can regulate production of urine. Now, the other thing to notice here is that on top of these capillaries of the glomerulus, you have these cells that are called podocytes, and they look like these octopi in the sense that they have these legs that reach out with little feet. And in fact, the word pedicle means foot, and podocyte, also like a podiatrist, means a uh, cell with, with feet. And so notice that those cells that are wrapped on top of those capillaries are going to be selective for um, the filtration mechanism. And remember, we're going to discriminate based on size. And so just realize that within the, these uh, filtration slits in between these uh, pedicles, there's only so much space in there for uh, the molecules to be able to squeeze through. Okay, let's look at a close-up view of this glomerulus right here. So we're looking at this glomerulus, and we know that it's a spherical-shaped capillary network with these podocytes on top. So remember that podocyte means a cell with feet, and um, the feet are known as pedicles, and that's these right here. So there's a pedicle, and there's another pedicle. Now, in between the pedicles, that's where the filtration slits will be. And so anything in between the pedicles will be filtration slits, which is where the contents from the blood will try to get through. So now you want to imagine that you're inside here, you're the blood, and parts of that blood need to be able to get through. So we need to have a mechanism to not let the large stuff get through. Filtration only discriminates based on size. So all the smaller contents of the blood will get through. The larger contents will not get through. So first of all, we do have these fenestrations in these capillaries. That just means these, these holes or pores that are found in this particular set of capillaries. So these are going to be much more permeable 
than other capillaries found in other locations of your body. More stuff, in other words, will be able to get through these and uh, get filtered out into the capsule. Okay, so uh, you do also have a basal lamina, which is a protein um, basement membrane that also is going to prevent large proteins from getting through. It's also going to repel them based on charge. And then, of course, you have the slit membrane between the pedicles. So you do have these different uh, layers that are not going to are not going to allow the large stuff to get through. Here is a high magnification, really cool picture of an electron microscope, and it shows you, for example, okay, well, this is the cell body over here of the uh, of the of the podocyte. These are the primary processes, um, and the uh, secondary processes just means the pedicles themselves. And then in between those pedicles, that's where you would find the filtration slits. So this picture is cool because it lets us see, okay, what's found inside the blood? Well, you're gonna find a red blood cell, you're gonna find a white blood cell, you're gonna have other solutes, um, and those could be anything like uh, sodium and, and chloride, urea, small amino acids, and so forth, the little stuff. That's what we mean by solutes, and those are all those dots in there. You also are going to find proteins, which are, are, are those right there, and um, also platelets. So you'll see some little cell fragments like platelets right there. And so all this stuff is going to go in through the afferent arterial and then is going to circulate through this, um, this uh, glomerulus. And based on pressure, we're going to start pushing a lot of this stuff through the filtration slits and into that uh, Bowman's capsule so that it can go and start going through that proximal convoluted tubule right there. So let's take a little slice of a little piece of this glomerulus and see it from a side view. And here you can really see, okay, I've got the RBC right there. I've got the WC, uh, uh, the WBC right there. I've got the platelets right there. There is a protein. There's a smaller protein. And here is that simple squamous epithelium of capillaries with the pores, or the, the fenestrations right there. And then this right here is a pedicle, another pedicle, and in between you have the uh, filtration slit right there where things can go through. So just realize, based on this picture, the cells will not be able to get through. They're way too big. So no red blood cells, no white blood cells, no platelets should get through, no large proteins should get through. So what can get through? What can be inside the filtrate? Water is going to be small enough to get through, of course. Glucose will get through very easily. Amino acids, ions, urea, hormones, vitamins, ketones. And when they say small amount of protein, they mean the smaller ones. So the small, some smaller proteins can get through. Most proteins cannot get through. They're going to be repelled by charge or they're just going to be too big to get through. Uh, those uh, those fenestra or filtration slits. The other thing we want to notice here is, again, we have labeled for us the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And so this right here, you have to imagine, okay, well, if this is the proximal convoluted tubule and it's going to go this way, just remember that they've chopped it off right here. They've chopped off the picture it's going to wind and weave, and then it's going to descend as a, as a descending limb, and then ascend, and then it's going to start winding and weaving again. And so notice that here, as it ascends this way, and it winds and weaves, it becomes the distal convoluted tubule. And so the rest of the nephron is just not being shown, right? So there's still going to be a loop of Henle and all that. It's just not being shown in this picture. 
And again, what we have here are going to be those, uh, those macula densa cells that are going to be checking the contents of the filtrate. And then the, uh, those um, juxta uh, glomerular cells that are going to be uh, influenced by the macula densa cells to either vasoconstrict the afferent arterial or to vasodilate the afferent arterial, depending on how much blood flow we want uh, to, to be going into the glomerulus. So really, there are these three parts of urine formation. The first part is the glomerular filtration, which is the first part of this process, which starts at the renal corpuscle. And we got to get the, uh, the fluid from the blood to go towards the uh, towards the um, the nephron. After step one, we need to reabsorb most of what we filtered out. So just remember that um, okay, there are really three parts to urine formation. The first part is the glomerular filtration. And this one is based on size and it takes place at the renal corpuscle. And because it's based on size, we lose both the good stuff and the bad stuff through the filtrate. Now the good stuff is your water and your glucose, your amino acids, uh, your, your salts. Those are the good things that you need to get back eventually. The bad stuff is the stuff that you are trying to get rid of and the whole reason why you have a urinary system is to get rid of this stuff and those are your toxins. So your urea, your creatinine, your ammonia, your uric acid. So if you're getting rid of the good stuff and the bad stuff in glomerular filtration, you need to reabsorb all that good stuff back. And that's why the nephron continues for so long after the Bowman's capsule is because we need to reabsorb it. So during tubular reabsorption, we're going to get back our good stuff. And finally, to fine tune all of this and to get rid of more, in quotes, bad stuff, and we're going to talk about what that is going to look like, that's going to be called tubular secretion. Now, these three parts of your information are not exactly in sequence, but as a general rule, if we look at an extended nephron, where instead of having it all loopy and bent, we straighten it out, um, the glomerular filtration will be the first thing that happens. Um, and next, especially in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, we have a ton of tubular reabsorption. So most of our stuff will come back uh, in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then much later on, towards the end of the nephron, that's where a lot of the tubular secretion, a lot of the fine tuning, a lot of basically re-injecting stuff from the blood into that tubule again is gonna take place before we finally get our final product, our urine. Okay, so, um, we need to look at the forces that are going to be driving this uh, filtration, this glomerular filtration. So we're in the renal corpuscle, and basically in one day, 150 to 180 liters of water pass uh, through this filtration apparatus. That is a ton of water. And so uh, what is driving all of this? Now, if you're asking yourself, well, how is that even possible? What we're going to see is that almost all of that gets reabsorbed later in the nephron. Well, how this is possible is that 
we start with this glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which is pretty elevated. If you remember the Starling law, it was nowhere near 55 millimeters of mercury. It was, it was 35. But this one is elevated because that afferent arter arterial typically likes to open wide and dilate itself to be large so that you get a lot of blood flow going through it. And if you have more blood flow, you're going to have more pressure from that fluid that goes into this. So glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, just think of it as blood pressure. Now, this blood pressure is going to be pushing the contents from the inside to the outside, right? So basically that, that will be a positive sign because it's going to push fluid out into the capsule. And that is the GBHP that's in this equation right here at 55 millimeters of mercury. Now, what is uh, going against this is the capsular hydrostatic pressure. And the capsular hydrostatic pressure, well, just imagine there's going to be fluid in here as well in that capsule. And that fluid is going to be pushing back. And that's the, the, the fluid pressure from whatever fluid is in that capsule at any given time. And that is going to be at 15 millimeters of mercury. But because the arrow is going back towards the capillary, right, we need to give it a negative sign because it's going against the um, glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. So that's the 15. So right now we have 55 positive and 15 negative. The third one is the blood colloid osmotic pressure, which again is going to be higher than in the Starling law because of so much uh, leakage of water that the blood inside the glomerulus is, has a pretty strong osmolarity and therefore more osmotic pressure. Now remember, the osmotic pressure is from the solutes in the blood, which will be trying to drag the fluid back towards it, right? So the, it's, it's via osmosis trying to pull the water back because of the solutes found inside the blood. And that's pretty, pretty high at minus 30 millimeters of mercury. So when we do this math all together, plus 55, minus 15, minus 30, we get a net of positive 10 millimeters of mercury. In other words, the total, if we look at all of it, is going to be plus 10 going out. And this plus 10 going out will eventually become the filtrate that goes into the proximal convoluted tubule. So, of course, plus 10 is, is a pressure uh, it's a plus 10 pressure, but it gives you a sense of also um, uh, quantity of fluid and how much of that will be getting pushed towards the proximal convoluted tubule. Let's talk about renal regulation. We're going to have four ways to regulate the kidneys. The first one is auto-regulation. Auto means itself. So this is very localized within the, uh, the afferent arterial itself. And so what we want to do is, for any of these regulations, we want to either vasoconstrict or vasodilate the afferent arterial. Now, this is known as the myogenic mechanism because the myogenic mechanism has to do with the muscle itself reflexively responding to either an increase in blood pressure or a decrease in blood pressure. So imagine a situation where arterial blood pressure increases. So this could be from exercise or a fight or flight response causing your blood pressure to go up. If the blood pressure goes up, then the glomerular uh, blood hydrostatic pressure will go up and your filtration rate will go up. Now, sometimes we call it the glomerular filtration rate or GFR. So 
if every time you exercise your GFR goes up, you're going to lose a lot of water, a lot of electrolytes, a lot of good stuff that you don't want to lose every single time you exercise. So this is a reflexive mechanism that fixes that problem for you. So imagine your blood pressure increases uh, because of exercise or a fight or flight response. Your GFR starts going up because of that increase in pressure. However, this myogenic mechanism kicks in and the afferent arterial responds. The afferent arterial is stretched from that increase in blood pressure and it reflexively is going to constrict. And so notice here in this picture right here that afferent arterial has gotten very small and now the GFR has dropped back down to normal, which is what we want. Now the opposite happens as well. So now imagine that you go into a parasympathetic state and your blood pressure drops all of a sudden. Well, if your blood pressure drops, what you don't want is to stop producing urine because the toxins in your body can start building up. And so you still want to have your GFR at homeostatic levels. So what's going to happen is, is that as, those, as that afferent arterial relaxes uh, because of that decrease in uh, blood pressure, it's going to reflexively dilate and allow for blood to flow more easily into the glomerulus. And you see here, this afferent arterial is well dilated, allowing for more blood to flow, and it's going to bring GFR back up, back to homeostatic levels. The second mechanism is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which we have referred to already uh, several times. And this is where the macula densa of that, either the ascending limb or that distal convoluted tubule, those macula densa cells are going to be checking the contents of the filtrate. And depending on how concentrated that filtrate is with salt, it's going to influence that afferent arterial. So let's see how this works. Well, imagine a situation where your blood pressure goes up. If your blood pressure goes up, you're going to have more filtrate and more, uh, more fluid going through this uh, tubule. And the more fluid you have going through that tubule, the more fluid is gonna be hitting these macula densa cells and it's going to be activating them because the more fluid you have, the more salt from that fluid is going to run into those macula densa cells. And those macula densa cells basically have receptors there that monitor the salt concentration, chemoreceptors, right? So that more salt runs into that and then these macula densa cells will be activated. What's another mechanism that could do this for us? Another mechanism is if you are dehydrated and you have higher salt concentrations because you're dehydrated, let's say, then those higher salt concentrations, because you've lost a lot of water but you still have salt, those, those higher salt concentrations will be shown in the filtrate. And again, that is going to um, basically cause those macula densa cells to get activated. So what happens next? Well, what happens is those macula densa cells detect that increased uh, sodium and, and as a response, they release molecules like ATP that can cause vasoconstriction of that afferent arterial. And notice if your blood pressure has gone up, right? You want to vasoconstrict that afferent arterial in order to not let as much blood flow into that glomerulus, right? That's for during exercise, for example, very similar to the myogenic response. Um, and on the other hand, if you are dehydrated, that's another situation where you do not want a lot of blood going to that glomerulus because you already are missing uh, water. And so the last thing you want is to send more blood that way uh, towards the glomerulus and to get, and that's just going to get rid of more water, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to release ATP 
that ATP is going to go to those um, contractile cells of the afferent arterial and get them to start contracting. And these are the granular cells right here that are going to help with those contractions. Now, uh, those granular cells are going to cause that afferent arterial to vasoconstrict in the presence of ATP, but also these macula densa cells have the ability to decrease the secretion of nitric oxide. So we decrease nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a vasodilator, but if you decrease nit nitric oxide levels, you automatically vasoconstrict. So the result is constriction, which decreases blood flow, and the response is a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, and this brings us back to homeostasis. The third way that we can control uh, renal regulation is with the nervous system, and this is going to be primarily with the sympathetic nervous system either shutting on or off. So uh, not so much the parasympathetic, but mostly whether you have a sympathetic tone or not. And so the sympathetic nervous system, once it kicks in, of course, this is your fight or flight response. We're going to see adrenaline, adrenaline and nor adrenaline levels going up. And these will automatically cause uh, constrictions of the arterioles. And we can see this also during strenuous exercise or in acute conditions like circulatory shock. And over here on the right, you just have a picture if you're still having uh, a hard time visualizing this whole afferent arterial uh, concept. Imagine a water hose with a leak because of a hole inside the hose and the water's leaking out. And if, uh, if the water is going from left to right, then if you step on the water hose, you are vasoconstricting that afferent arterial. And by vasoconstricting it, you should see less leakage in the water hose. Now, uh, what we don't talk about as much just because of time constraints is the efferent arterial also uh, contributing to the pressure that's found inside the glomerulus. Because imagine dilating the afferent arterial and constricting the um, efferent arterial simultaneously, right? Well, that's going to cause a buildup of pressure inside the glomerulus, and you can see that a lot more leakage has taken place in that case. So the efferent arterial is also going to be manipulated, but uh, it's, it's just not as much referred to in this lecture, but just keep that in mind. Okay, the fourth way to control the uh, regulation of the production of uh, urine is going to be with the RAA pathway, which we've talked about already with the nerve, with the, uh, I'm sorry, with the endocrine system, and also with the, um, the blood vessel chapter. So this is just a review, but it's good to review it again. Um, it starts with a protein being made by the liver, which is always going to be in abundance in the blood, and that's called angiotensinogen. Notice it tells you it's a pretty big uh, protein of 453 amino acids. Now, in times of blood pressure dropping, we're going to secrete renin from those, um, those juxtaglomerular cells. And those juxtaglomerular cells releasing renin are activated because of the drop in blood pressure. They act as baroreceptors, so they realize it. That renin, once it's released, runs into angiotensinogen and it cleaves it or cuts it into a smaller chain of amino acids, 10 amino acids long, called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 already has some properties where it can start some uh, vasoconstriction, but uh, not really powerful yet. We need to activate it a bit more. So angiotensin 1 is going to circulate 
to the lungs, which are going to have high levels of a enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And this is going to cleave it again to an even smaller amino acid chain of eight amino acids. And we call that angiotensin II. So angiotensin II is going to cause vasoconstriction, right? So just remember, the original stimulus was a drop in blood pressure. And if we have a drop in blood pressure, we, the last thing we want to do is to, uh, to have uh, dilated vessels. We want to constrict them. Um, but we also want to constrict that afferent arterial so that we don't bring blood to that glomerulus so that we're not making a lot of urine during times of low blood pressure. We want to keep our fluids inside our body during those times in order to try to bring our blood pressure back up. So it's an RAA pathway. So the R is for renin, the A is for angiotensin, and the third the third letter, the second A, is for aldosterone. So another thing that angiotensin II does, it goes to the adrenal cortex, which is an endocrine gland that sits above the kidney and gets that adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. Well, aldosterone works on the kidneys retaining salt, right? So the kidneys are going to retain sodium. Uh, in other words, put sodium back into the bloodstream, right? Instead of peeing it out, it's going to hold on to it, put it inside the blood. And water is going to follow the salt. If water follows the salt, you're going to end up holding on to salt plus water. And that's going to start the process of trying to uh, bring your blood pressure back up. And then, of course, the third thing that we need to do is we need to affect your behavior. So angiotensin II also affects your hypothalamus, which is where your thirst center resides, and basically tells you you're thirsty, and so go drink a cup of water, and that's going to bring your blood volume back up and will cause your blood pressure to go back up to homeostatic levels. The whole purpose of having a urinary system is to get rid of the waste products that accumulate during the metabolism that's going on in every single cell of your body at any given second. And specifically, what we want to talk about are the nitrogenous wastes that accumulate and that can go up in very high levels and become toxic if they are not excreted by your urinary system. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the word amino means nitrogen. So when you say, okay, amino acids are the building blocks of protein, that means that it is a nitrogen containing acid molecule. And so the proteins that you're making and that you're breaking down, okay, in your metabolism at any given second are constantly giving off nitrogenous waste products. Also, nucleic acids, the RNA and the DNA of your body also contain nitrogen. So those bases of thymine and adenine and cytosine, um, and et cetera, all have nitrogen inside of them. And so when you are doing metabolism of those and recycling those as well, you get these metabolic nitrogenous wastes. So here are the most important examples of these. So you have ammonia, which notice is basically a nitrogen with three hydrogens attached to it. You have urea, which is where the word urine comes from, where you see that nitrogen right there uh, on both sides attached to that carbon. Um, you also see creatinine, which is from the breakdown of creatine inside your muscles, which, if you remember, is a mechanism to hold on to extra phosphates for energy. But as that gets recycled also, that builds up, and that has nitrogen inside of it as well. And um, finally, from the nucleic acids, you end up getting uric acid. And if you remember what your 
uh, your nitrogenous bases look like. That's what they look like. They had these rings with nitrogens and carbons making up those rings. So this is the reason why we need to basically make urine in the first place. This is also the reason why kidney failure leads to death is because of the buildup of these toxic molecules. So the best way to explain this is to look at this chart, which shows you how much you filter out and how much you reabsorb per day of a lot of these molecules. So let's start with water. And so for water, you have about three liters of water inside your blood plasma on average. And if you think about a two liter bottle of soda, that gives you a sense of how much water you've got, right? Two liter bottles, okay, you've got three liters of water inside your plasma. Okay, so then it says over here, how much is filtered per day? In other words, we're talking about that renal corpuscle. So you get, you get this filtration that takes place inside that Bowman's capsule, that fluid goes in the Bowman's capsule. How much, if you look at all the nephrons, in both kidneys and you add it all up, how much do you filter out per day? And the answer is 180 liters of water. Okay, how does that make any sense? You only have three. How in the world are you gonna filter out 180? Well, you're filtering it out all the time, right? So every second, every millisecond, you're filtering some of that out. And the answer to see how, the, how this works is that you end up reabsorbing, right? Because remember, the, the nephron keeps going. You've got the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle and all that. We need to reabsorb most of that. And so most of that ends up getting reabsorbed anyways. So 100 and, let's just use 178 as our number just to simplify this. Let's say you reabsorb 178 liters of water in the rest of the nephron, well, how much water do you need to drink every day in order to maintain your water levels? Because you're gonna lose two liters, right? And that's gonna end up becoming your urine. So you need to make sure that you drink about two liters every day if that's how much you're losing in order to maintain your water levels. Okay, let's look at the next one uh, I want to look at. It's going to be glucose. So glucose, about three grams of glucose inside your blood at any given moment. You filter out 162. Remember, glucose is small. It's going to go right through those uh, fenestra and filtration slits. So uh, it's all going to leak out with the filtrate. And uh, check this out. You should never have glucose in your urine under normal circumstances because you reabsorb 100% of it. Glucose is an energy molecule, right? So you don't want to be losing energy uh, through your urine. And so you're going to reabsorb 100% of that under normal circumstances. And that's going to be at 162 grams back. Uh, amount in the urine should be zero. Now, there are some conditions like diabetes, uh, which we're going to talk about, where you do end up seeing urine uh, that does have glucose in it, but in, uh, in normal cases, there should be absolutely no glucose in the urine. Okay, what about uh, proteins? We did say that uh, so uh, most proteins do not get filtered out because they're too large. The smaller ones do. So 200 grams inside the blood, two grams do get filtered out. So notice what, what a small amount that is of proteins that actually do squeeze through those filtration slits. And anyways, whatever ones you do lose, you do reabsorb almost all of that back, right? Almost 100%, you do reabsorb back and you do have some amino acids uh, some proteins that do uh, get lost in the urine. And here are the toxins. So urea does end up um, getting um, 
filtered out. It's small enough to get filtered out. So uh, you do have one gram at any given time inside the blood. 54 grams do get um, filtered out. You do reabsorb about half of it, which is enough in order to keep your toxin levels low. So you are getting rid of a ton of urea in the urine. And creatinine, again, one of those toxins that we talked about that we want to get rid of, notice that we, uh, we do filter out a lot of it and we reabsorb none of it. And that's because we don't want any of it back. There is a reason for, for reabsorbing some urea in terms of kidney function. And uh, we're probably not going to have enough time to talk about it. So that's why you do reabsorb some urea. But uh, for uh, creatinine, we absolutely don't need it. It's a toxin. We want to get rid of all of it. We don't want to reabsorb it. So all of that that we filtered out ends up getting excreted into the urine. 